then look at uh, lactose, I think we can agree that we, we started this conversation about um, how dairy has an effect, how people are losing kind of the going off the course of dairy more into kind of the, the aspect of uh, vegan and plant based. So to bring this back full circle, then, I think we'd be agreeing that dairy and lactose are not the same. They're, they're two different reasons, maybe why people would uh, not you know, some people would just, it's for the dairy purpose. Some people it's not for the um, lactose purpose. So when we come into then the actual removal of these things, and, and let's focus a bit more now in the, the dairy aspect of things, what other major things could people be missing out on uh, aside from maybe lactose by removing dairy from the diet? Are there things that actually you would say actually probably is worth still having these? Yeah, um, I, I definitely there are definitely things that you can be missing out on by removing dairy. It's not to say that you can't get these things from other uh, other sources, but uh, for most people, dairy is a really, really key source of certain nutrients. Um, for people involved in fitness and physique uh, kind of sports, um, pr- protein is sort of one of the key ones. The most, mm-hmm. the most popular protein, supplemental protein sources are whey and casein, which are the two, um, the two proteins in milk. Or the two groups of protein in milk. Um, so removing these, uh, if you're an athlete uh, or into physique or anything like that, you can suddenly find that you no longer uh, have an easy go-to high-quality protein source. Uh, you might replace it with another protein powder, but on the whole, those generally aren't as high quality. Even if you're looking at something like soy, uh, which is probably the next most the next most popular plant-based, um, you t- tend to be better off taking something like whey. Uh, or casein so lots of people find that there's a hole in their diet if they remove uh, dairy products because of that Um, Mm -hmm. but also if you just generally eat a decent amount of cheese and milk and you're not interested in fitness you can still see a decent drop in protein from um, from removing that even if you're not taking things like whey protein because um, not only might you be removing uh the higher quality protein sorry a decent amount of protein but you'd also losing the, mo- the highest quality protein yeah so protein would be one of the key ones not obviously not to say you can't replace it with other with other proteins um but that is a really key one and it's something that many people who are transitioning to a plant-based vegan vegetarian diet say um will not necessarily think about because protein has never really been on their mind whereas mm-hmm. if you're involved in you know, resistance training or fitness or physique sports, things like that. Protein really is front and center in your mind. You're already thinking about how do I get enough protein? You're probably already taking protein shakes, bars, some kind of protein supplement. Um, yeah. So it's something that athletes probably aren't going to be missing out on if they move because they'll make that active decision to change and think. But if you are just an average person, um, you may be missing out on the protein if you don't make extra effort to think about it. So you mentioned then, uh, just to take you back a couple of uh, sentences, you mentioned about um, proteins and and we've spoken about protein quite a lot and our clients will know uh, what our thoughts are on different types of proteins. But for those who aren't aware, you mentioned about, um, I think the word you used was uh, a higher quality protein. Uh, And then you said that soy was on the kind of, in terms of a vegan choice, uh, probably the highest up there. Why why are we still talking about kind of higher quality? What are we trying to to get across there? Um, just for those who maybe aren't aware, how would you define that for those people? Yeah, um, so protein quality is quite an important thing. Um, and I think to talk about protein quality, I think it's important to know um, what protein is, how it works, how it's metabolized to understand, um, understand the differences between proteins. So um, I'll just give you a brief rundown on that. No doubt you're very comfortable and very familiar with this, but um, I'll sit back and enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, protein is basically a, a chain, a chain of amino acids, and amino acids are um, molecules that uh, that once together they form active proteins. So there are twenty different amino acids uh, that commonly occur in the diet, and nine of these are what are called the essential amino acids. So essential amino acids are amino acids that your body can't produce themselves even if you have all of the uh, the building blocks for those even if you have all the the required actual ingredients your body simply can't process them it doesn't have the machinery to do that uh, the other 11 amino acids are called the non-essential amino acids and your body can churn those out pretty comfortably provided it has all the building blocks so when we talk about protein quality what we're looking for is something that is a complete protein and a complete protein 
is one that has all nine of the essential amino acids in good quant in sufficient quantities, basically. So, um, what you find with animal-based proteins, whether that's actual animal flesh or animal products like dairy, is that pretty much all of the proteins from animals are complete proteins. Um, I'm not aware of any animal-based proteins that aren't complete, but if anyone knows any, please <laughs> do inform me. I'd be very interested to hear. Um, and these, these animal-based proteins, the complete proteins, tend to have a really high proportion of essential amino acids. And at sort of, if you if you think of it as a as a pyramid or a, a sort of a pecking order of proteins, you have lots of you have most meat, you have eggs, and then at the very top you have things like the whey pro, whey protein, casein protein, the milk proteins. Egg is also very high, um, but you're really talking about milk proteins as being sort of the gold standard. Um, now, when you're comparing things like um, the animal based proteins, there's not a huge amount of difference. But when you look on the other end of the spectrum at the lower quality proteins, these tend to be plant-based proteins. And there's a much bigger difference between the plant-based proteins uh, or the lower quality proteins and most animal animal proteins. So plant-based proteins tend to be lacking in one or more of the essential amino acids. Um, so they're incomplete proteins on the whole. Now, there are some that are complete proteins, like I mentioned, soy uh, and pea being two of the the most sort of common uh, and most important, most complete proteins that are freely available. Um, but even those are slightly low on some other amino acids. So it's worth, uh, for, in, in, for instance, with those taking slightly larger amounts than you would have, say, whey. But then if you look at other, other plant-based proteins, things like, um, say, gluten, wheat protein, that's incredibly low quality. And you need much larger quantities of that to... Uh, to get the same benefits from other protein, from higher quality proteins. Um, and like I said, many of these are incomplete. So uh, you have to really be making sure that you're making an effort to get a good variety of plant-based protein if you're going to achieve uh, all the benefits of protein. And actually one thing that many vegans, vegetarians do uh, that can be very helpful, it's very time consuming and it's a bit tricky, is what's called matching uh, protein sources. So you can get one protein source that is, say, missing one specific amino acid and pair it with another protein that's high in the missing amino acid but has another missing amino acid of its own that the first protein source compensates for. So by combining the two, you get a full spectrum of amino acids and you're not really missing out on that quality issue. Um, but the thing is, if you're doing that, you need to be combining multiple things. You can't just take a scoop of whey protein, put it in a shaker, drink it and go. You need to put some effort in and think about what you're eating. You probably need to be eating it as a whole food unless you're going to be mixing a number of powders, which you can do, but it just takes that extra level of, of effort and thought to it. Definitely. The You look at um, vegan proteins, for example, and some people might wonder why they're blended. Um, so if you've got a blend, mm. the next time you check it out, I know my protein do on it and it's pretty good. Um, you'll often see that the blend is... Uh, a combination and, and a good blend and um, you can correct me on this but from my from my knowledge a good blend is where you have not just like uh, a load of different seeds right you have maybe a seed a bean and a rice or and and the reason they've done that is exactly as ollie said there is to try and match the amino acid profiles of these things and i don't know if you saw this but a study came out i think in february earlier this year um, which was quite fascinating because what they did is they managed to match proteins. They matched the amino acid profiles of uh, vegan sources versus whey. And even when matched to make the same profile, they still weren't as efficient. And that's because whey is so easily digestible. So one of the things that came up in the kind of uh, researcher's notes, if you like, or the mm. discussion, uh, was that the actual digestibility and bioavailability of whey protein is so exceptional in comparison mm. that you have uh, this protein which is not only easily digestible but very well functioning as well now that's not to say that that a a vegan protein isn't effective because of course if you choose to go vegan or be plant-based then of course you can still have these alternatives and as ollie has said there absolutely it's possible to do so sometimes it just takes a little bit more in terms of the the, the diligence that it takes to kind of put those together now, 
I think we're going to be in agreement with this, but I think we should talk about it anyway, um, is going to be the kind of uh, protein sources, quote unquote, that people ingest that just aren't what we would class as a protein source. And in terms of nutrition and digestion, um, the the side of things where we're looking at kind of the effect of uh, whey protein versus, say, a nut protein or, say, a seed protein, that's one thing. But when we have a protein which is also included in a vegan diet, we tend to have a lot more carbohydrate and a lot more fat. Um, talk us through just briefly kind of how that would impact. So obviously we know in terms of a macro um, split or in calories, we're obviously going to be lower on protein and higher on the other kind of fats and carbs. But does that have any other notable effect that you know of um, or anything that maybe we need to be concerned or not necessarily concerned, but aware of? Yeah. Um, yeah, just to touch on the study, I do know the study. I can't remember the uh, the title or the author, but I have read it, and it was um, it was an interesting study. It was an, it was elegantly done um, to right. match these uh, to match these protein sources, and yeah, that's why um, if I speak to a vegan or uh, primarily a vegan rather than vegetarian, I always suggest that they're on the the very higher end of the suggested protein intakes uh, if they are. Yeah. Uh, fitness or physique oriented up to the sort of 2.2 grams per kilo of protein rather yeah. than maybe at the lower end which is like 1.6 we always shoot that so if we had say someone or i've had clients before who have gone from an omnivorous diet omnivorous being eats everything well not literally everything but you know um uh, to a vegan diet and and a starting point for me then would be like okay let's try and add about 20 percent just as a starting point while you're transitioning and then once we've got to that point and you're settled then we can start really putting in these numbers and seeing because if you take someone who's maybe on that kind of pound per gram sorry pound uh, gram per pound of body weight so one gram of protein per pound that can be quite a jump for some people when they've not necessarily been used to that in terms of you know that that's roughly two uh, grams of protein per kilo of body weight so 2.2 pounds to a kilo um, so those of you who are kind of 60 kilos 50 kilos that's up in the 130s 140s um, and you might be at the moment even in an, an omnivorous diet only in the 100s 100s to 20s and we're saying right we need to add another 30 that's one thing if you're eating all of these full amino sources but when it's you know when we're taking it down a step to uh the kind of plant-based area of things it can make it very difficult right yeah because... i mean you're going straight from not if you're going from an omnivorous diet not only you're getting the quality but you've got so many options for protein and then you're suddenly saying okay we're, we're taking all the easy protein sources and you have to eat more it's it's <laughs> really difficult um yeah but yeah, that that would be what I'd advise. And it sounds like you guys have, have hit the nail on the head, uh, you know, to increase it when you're moving from one to the other. Um, and go, that's why going, having a stage in between, having that vegetarian stage before going to yeah. veganism, if you're going to do that, can help to make that transition to um, sort of perfecting the diet or making sure you're getting enough of certain nutrients can be quite quite helpful and quite important certainly in terms of kind of uh, exposures to these things as well i think one of the things that people and, and jack and i discussed this last week because jack started eating beef again um and he was saying that he caught very much in the kind of mindset of i'm a vegan i i, I kind of do this and he was saying actually that that's just not a thing you know i encourage people not to be all of one thing or all of another and he was saying you know he's always eating sushi because he loves sushi <laughs> and uh and you know he's saying that actually it's more important for him that he has these things in his diet now that he's gaining he needs more protein without having to eat hundreds of carbs and fats to get those full profiles in because of course we know that if we're mixing all these beans and, and pulses and, and seeds and so on it's not just protein we're getting it's now a lot more fat a lot more carbohydrate so there's a consideration there and if you jump straight from one thing to the other and without that kind of intermediate phase i think that can be quite a daunting step um and, and i would encourage you know you to take that kind of phase but also not see this as i have to be all or nothing because of course there are reasons why people decide to go plant-based go vegan uh we have environmental we have obviously the the more ethical reasons but if we're going down the lines of um kind of the more environmental purposes or, or reasons uh, I know you've got some some good facts on whey protein, um, and I think it would be cool if you could kind of talk through why maybe if you are transitioning, it might be beneficial to hold on to that as a supplement. Yeah, um, I realise I hadn't fully answered your questions on your question earlier on um, <laughs> uh, getting protein with uh, with other 
without getting those other things like fats and fiber. So I'll come to that. Um, yep. But yeah, you're right. It's uh, it's great if you can still, uh, if you're moving towards a more plant-based diet, if you were looking for things to retain in your diet that would still support your physique-based goals. Um, I think I think protein powders, whey protein, casein protein are a really good option for that. Um, because as I said, they're, they're really high quality. Um, they, um, they have specific uses. So whey is particularly nice post-exercise. Casein is a good option before bed. You know, these are, you know, they, they do have their benefits. So if yeah. an individual is looking to transfer to a more plant-based diet, although you may be wanting to remove certain things like, um, like say animal, animal meat, flesh, that's perfectly understandable. Um, but like you said, there's no reason to be acting sort of in, in an on-off manner, vegan or omnivorous or anything like that. You don't need to be one or the other. You can certainly move towards being more environmentally friendly or ethically uh, ethically aware and still maintain some of those dietary habits that you have that are particularly important, particularly useful. And if I were moving, if you, know, if you came to me and put a gun to my head and said, tomorrow hmm. you are now vegan, I, but you can keep one animal source, you know, animal animal food. One of the things I'd probably keep would be whey protein, um, not because it's delicious and it's my favourite food, but <laughs> because it's really high quality. And from a physique and fitness standpoint, it's one of those things that offers sort of head and shoulders above its competitors, uh, benefits above those. Um, although I've missed lots of other things, you know, from a from a pure physique fitness. Um, standpoint that will be one of the things to keep um other things you could consider would be things like say yogurt uh skier which is a nice protein source that's low in fat and relatively low in carbohydrate and sugar that can be quite a nice one but protein is is really important and uh yeah, whey protein is a particularly useful one to keep in the diet uh and yes to come back to your other question uh, the other question on uh um, fat and fiber and all the things that you tend to get with um, vegan, vegetarian, plant-based um, sources of protein. Um, it's quite tricky, you know, to, to get a protein source that is pure protein when you're on when you're excluding animal animal sources. You know, as omnivores, we're able to say, okay, chicken, almost all of the calories in this they're from protein. That's fine. Here's yeah. my protein source, so I can have chicken, rice, veg. And I'm good. I've got the things I need for this meal. Um, it's much more difficult as a vegan uh, if you're excluding um, animal meat uh, and animal products because those are the things that tend to be pure protein without fat, carbohydrate, fiber, things like that. If you do that, if you are vegan, vegetarian, one of the best things you can do is try to incorporate those few um, vegan or plant-based uh, sources of protein that are particularly high in protein and don't have many of those other things so uh, i believe uh, tofu uh, is fairly good for those for, for that uh, as is seitan which i believe is wheat uh, and so is mycoprotein so corn um, that's quite good although it does have some fiber and still has some fats and things they're not mm -hmm. perfect but they do go a long way to um, you being able to say okay here is my protein source for the meal and then if you want to complement it with other things you can do quite easily um, but what I'm sure you see lots of, and I know I do is people saying, okay, um, <laughs> I'm going to move to a plant-based diet and I'm going to have peanut butter because peanut butter is high in protein. Everyone knows peanut butter is high in protein. Um, but I think most people who are in, who know their fitness and know their nutrition are act will actually agree with me and say, well, peanut butter is less of a protein source and much more of a fat source. Um, yeah. You know, it's fifty percent fat by weight and about twenty five percent fat, uh, twenty five percent protein by weight. So you're not really getting much bang for your buck in terms of protein for your calories. Um, although something like if you, for uh, interesting fact actually, we were talking about combining protein sources earlier. If you combine um, brown bread and um, peanut butter, you do get a complete protein, uh, or you get a complete mixed protein source. <laughs> Um, but the thing is, the peanut butter sandwich, to get 20 grams of protein, we're probably talking 500 calories, maybe 400 calories. Yeah. Quite a few. Yeah, it's quite a lot. And you're also getting that fiber and fat alongside it. Um, hummus is another one. Um, 
is a complete protein because of the tahini, which is sesame seeds, and the chickpeas. Uh, they complement one another and they form a complete protein. Um, but again, really high in fat from the sesame seeds and quite a lot of fiber from the uh, from the chickpeas. So it, it's really difficult to find these protein sources that are not high in fat, not high in fiber, because obviously fat and fiber, you know, they're important. We need them in the diet. Um, fiber especially is particularly healthy. Fat we do need just for general day-to-day -day function and can be really useful. But there are times when we don't necessarily want to be eating large amounts of those, such as pre-workout, your pre-workout meal and your post-workout meal. So it can be hard to manage that. And what I'd say is if you are a vegetarian or vegan, um, if, you can't, if you're not having something like a whey protein or casein protein, do invest in a good protein powder, something like soy or pea uh, is particularly good. You can buy blends. They tend to be more expensive, but um, soy protein is fairly good. Just use a bit more. Like we were saying, shoot for those yeah. higher daily intakes and those slightly higher per meal intakes. So for those of you celebrating at home thinking you get away with eating buckets of hummus, <laughs> I heard your heart drop from here. <laughs> Um, but you're totally right. This is a discussion slash debate slash argument we've been having in the household at the moment. And that is on the collective protein sources that people have. And, you know, we kind of go around the kitchen. Well, a digestive biscuit has one gram of protein. Uh, butter has, you know, six grams of protein. Milk has six grams of protein. And uh, bread has 11 grams of protein, you know. But the truth is these, these proteins aren't the same caliber. Um, as a way and the other point to that is even if we could get it to the same caliber as you rightly said what is the calorie price we end up paying to match those things uh, because you know I always say that um, peanut butter is a fat source with protein in it not a protein source with fat in it because the majority there is um, is 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 definitely the 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 uh, sorry the the fat not the protein um, and that's that's definitely what is is the key there. So we have to then look at actually what is the most important thing for us? Is it getting fat in or is it getting protein in? And if we're transitioning, I can almost guarantee you that it's going to be uh, protein that's going to be most important there. I don't know if you saw um, there was a, a little infographic going around Instagram and probably Facebook and other social media as well. But I saw it on Instagram around the time that Game Changers came out. Um, oh goodness me! <laughs> uh, seems like you have a fairly similar view on game changes to me. It's just from that yeah. response, but um, it was quite interesting. It was a picture of uh, a big steak, lovely marbled steak, and a head of broccoli, and it had the sort of a caption something like um, "Per calorie, pro broccoli has more protein in than steak." I did see this. Mm. I did, yeah, I did see this. Yeah. And I think to the general population, they might look at that and go, oh, OK, right. Well, you know, this is, you know, this is true. And yeah. technically, this it is completely true. There are more grams of protein per calorie of broccoli. But the issue is um, the quantity of broccoli you have to actually eat to achieve that is astronomical. You know, to get a, yeah. a reasonable serving of protein, 25, 30, 40 grams, whatever it is based on your size and your, your activity levels, is really absolutely astronomical. So, you know, 30 yeah. gram serving of broccoli is something like two full florets of broccoli, whereas it's, you know, a palm sized piece of steak. Um, yeah. And so that's that's obviously why we express protein by weight, you know, protein grams of protein per 100 grams rather than grams of protein per 100 calories yes definitely definitely um and, and in doing that you know you you also i'm not going to get into game changers maybe that's like a discussion we can have as alongside netflix documentaries <laughs> on nutrition on another day uh, but but certainly it's what we spoke about it's about taking the information that you have and being sensible and thought provoking with that you know um I, I was always taught um in fact i don't know if you were in my seminar group when this happened but it's something that stuck with me forever i was having a nutrition um seminar by uh i cannot remember his name off the top of my head and i won't waste time on it but basically ben wall, wrote, dr ben wall it wasn't ben wall i used to love i thought I, his lectures were fantastic but it was um it was a professor a nutrition professor um 
Craig. Yes, Craig. Craig. Yes. I can't remember uh, his surname, but yeah. No, nor Craig. can I. It was him. <laughs> William. Best seminar I went to, right? So he started writing on the wall, uh, on, on the whiteboard, and, and everyone in true fashion starts like writing down all of these bits and bobs. He just kind of spoke a little bit about it. He said, you know, this is this. And everyone's like, oh, this is crazy. This is great. This is great. And he went, all of what I've just told you is a load of bollocks. And we're all looking around like, what's this guy on? He goes, the reason I wrote my name, and I remember he was a professor because he put professor on the board. He said, the reason I wrote that is because I wanted to test which of you in here was willing were willing to stand up and say, I'm not sure if that's right or not. And once you actually read what you just wrote down, I mean, it was quite high. It wasn't like simple stuff, like four and four is nine, but it was like verging on kind of unrealistic. And and when he's telling you this, you think he's a professor. Obviously, what he has to say is right. You know, this is quite clearly true. And, and from that day forward, it was just, for me, that was a real turning point in my like skepticism towards what people say. So whenever I see something, I think, is this bollocks or is this true? And then I'll try then with as least or as little bias as possible to investigate that. And, you know, we're not talking about going and reading 50 papers on whether broccoli is better than steak. <laughs> um, but it might be just about reading a little bit about where that, that has come from and the source it's come from. That's quite an important thing. If you're seeing a, a documentary on nutrition coming from Netflix, for example, I probably wouldn't waste your time watching it. Uh, that is a biased view, I'm, you know, but, but, but biased from the place of science, not from the place of me not liking Netflix. I love Netflix. Um, yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's important. Go on. Uh, I, was, I was just going to say, um, it's something that social media really highlights is that you just need something, you need a hook to make people think that you are credible and you can present patently false ideas as being true and we you know just because someone is a medical doctor it doesn't mean that they have any experience in nutrition or anything to do with uh, exercise um, but they can obviously make it seem as if they do by presenting some information that makes them yeah. feel credible plus those two little letters doctor um, yeah. same with people with phds unless that person has a phd in that specific area they're not they're not an expert in that area so don't listen to me if I come on here talking about electrolytes because I know nothing about electrolytes. Well, I know very little about electrolytes. Um, so I, I couldn't, t you know, just because someone has that um, yeah. that qualification or that, that following, it's worth looking into that person's biases and uh, expertise if it's something that's important to you that, or that you're discussing with people regularly or if it's something that you're interested in because there's a huge amount of bias. 100%. Last point on that, I would say scrutinize the things you spend your time and money on because they're things you can't get back. Yeah. Um, so once you've done that, you've wasted it. Uh, if you're going to buy a product or a book from someone, scrutinize that. Um, if you're going to spend time working with a coach, scrutinize them. Uh, if you're going to spend time listening to a podcast, check out their views, make sure they aren't you know uh, bias in any way and it might come across from listening to this that we have bias views towards everyone eating meat or everyone eating dairy products and hopefully it's not come across like that it's just that we're trying to show the beneficial side of things that people tend to demonize so we're trying to give you that ad that kind of opposite view that kind of actually maybe things are good maybe things aren't bad and i think it's really important that we 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 measure that um and that's why we talk about you know uh, we probably both like, do you like peanut butter? I like peanut butter. Ooh, uh, <laughs> but so we're not demonizing peanut butter either. It's about looking at all of the options that we have and taking them at, not just at face value, but what sits behind that and what's best for me, my money and my time and my effort. There's nothing worse than seeing someone pour time, money and effort into something and it just not being true. And as, as you've said, I'm not going to name any names here for want of not to slander anyone. But I can think of two or three people who in the medical field, you know, have professor or doctor who push uh, nutritional practices, which just factually, I don't know how it, it works, but they, they deal on people's fear, their fear of not being able to lose weight or their fear of being fat. And, and they capitalize financially on that. And I think it's disgraceful. Um, but unfortunately, as you've said, they use that DR at the start of the name or PROF and they, they rock and roll with it. Yeah, which is very sad. Supplements are just I, I, I learned this through the world of supplements. And I remember, you know, reading the, the blurbs of various supplements and thinking, wow, this is going to make me Mr. Olympia. 
Yeah. And then you actually re, you know, you look at the evidence and you listen to an expert and you look at some of the evidence and you actually realize, okay, this is 99% marketing. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So to bring this back um, full circle then into what, you know, the, the, the bulk of what we're, we've got here. If then we take into consideration all the things we've discussed here, we've got the fact that we have um, lactose is something which technically, you know, if you're intolerant to, then yeah, demonizing it to an extent within your own circle, i.e. your own bubble, you know, don't go on social media and be like, hey, lactose is terrible because it's just terrible for you. Um, We have, of course, that there are major bonuses in the fact that we see, and I'm sure there's going to be more studies coming out about the effects to do with lactose in terms of both endurance performance and potentially, as you said, for next year going on to look at actually the recovery aspect of it. And then we have the other section of the the conversation where we're looking at actually protein and actually what we potentially miss out when we decide that that dairy is is no longer going to be a part of our diet. Um, And actually the negative effect that that could have in terms of our physique based goals, um, but also on health. Obviously, protein plays a big role in health and and bone structure, muscle structure uh, and all of that stuff as well. And one thing Uh, I didn't touch on when we spoke, when I spoke briefly about removing uh, dairy from the diet is, you know, there are a number of other things really prevalent in dairy things like calcium which are really important for general health bone you know yeah. uh, bone health osteoporosis you know brittle bones really common uh really common health problem in the country and in the world at the moment uh, and that's partly mediated by uh, lack of calcium and lack of vitamin d both of which you know you find in milk so dairy products they're not just a, a performance based you know people think of them often think of okay dairy protein milk and fitness physique goals Mm -hmm. but then there's also a much more holistic view i don't like the word holistic but um, Mm -hmm. it conjured up too many bad memories of people selling holistic things Uh, but anyway (laughs) um it's a much more health and performance based holistic approach when it comes to dairy just as just as any food group can be i think to to kind of round this off and it's kind of taking that approach i discussed with jack it's that we don't need to be all black or white all up or down we can actually sit perfectly in the middle uh, you know you mentioned uh, off air about being flexitarian but you know flexitarian's not necessarily getting love from either camp right but actually that that could be the way to go here it could be that actually if if we all i mean you mentioned as well about not eating as much red meat if any red meat in comparison um and it's about taking on what your views are what your preferences are and then running forward with that it's not about listening to Jim from down the pub or, you know, Karen from accounts. It's about actually, what do I want to get out of this? And what's the most efficient way for me? And I think that that's something that a lot of people lose sight from or sight of uh, when on the fitness journey, because there's so many people touting the kind of, oh, this is what I did for six weeks and look what I achieved. But actually, it's not what you can see achieve in six weeks. It's what you can achieve in however long it takes you to do that but then maintain it for six weeks after that or you know go on to do something else and i think it's important that we recognize that uh in its entirety yeah definitely any final points from yourself ollie anything else you'd like to kind of press anything you'd like to underscore bold outline uh before we leave these lovely people i don't think so i think we've uh we've covered everything we we probably set out to um if anyone wants to uh find me i am on instagram uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I post a few science bits and bobs there. But otherwise, I think uh, we've covered everything, unless there's anything else. What are your tags? Do you know what yeah, your tags are for Ollie? Uh, Ollie, <laughs> Ollie uh, it's ollie.odell on Instagram, and then I think ollie underscore Odell on Twitter. I'll stick them in the description as well, so everyone Great. can have them, as long as you're happy for me to do that. Um, and again, you know, hopefully we'll have Ollie on again. So if it's something that the guys want, the girls want, then we can have maybe a Q&A. Uh, I'm sure there'll be loads of people asking me questions off the back of this. Then I'll ask you. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah, I'd love you. to. <laughs> Super job. It's been an absolute pleasure um, for me and the, the guys at JLX. Thank you ever so much for joining us this afternoon, taking your time to, to go through this all with us. We really do appreciate it. That's oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of your day, everyone else. If it's morning, evening or afternoon, enjoy either way. And we look forward to joining you all again soon. Have a good one. Bye-bye for now. 
we're going to be adding in a Q&A to the podcast in a few weeks time and to do that we're going to need some questions from you guys so do go over to our team Instagram page at JLX Coaching on Instagram of course and click the link in the bio and it will take you to a quick Google form where you can fill in Uh, any of the questions you've got and we will get to those in the podcast to come as for coaching you can also check the link in our instagram bio for that or go to the website which is at the moment jacklenton.com and you'll see the links to coaching there have a good day